Welcome, everybody. My name's Patrick Hallis. I'm a young professional at FAO, and this is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to a historic event today. It's a historic event because it's the first time an external speaker is addressing this newly created forum, which is UFIT, and it stands for um, Young Professional Forum for International Development. And we'll have uh, one of the co-founders come up shortly and tell you more about it. My role is a facilitator and moderator and timekeeper. Um, a few ground rules. We'll be together for one hour. The event is being taped, webcasted, I suppose. Um, we want this to be informal. We want this to be inspiring. We want this to be interactive. So for that, we have asked our guest today to keep his remarks to five to ten minutes and uh, be available to answer any of your questions and thoughts that you have during about half an hour. So uh, one important ground rule, uh, we live in a new communication age. Do put your cell phones on mute. Never hurts to check that. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce Christian Derlagen, who is the co-founder of UFIT, and he will tell you a bit about what this forum is all about. Christian. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, on behalf of uh, UFIT, the Young Professionals Forum for International Development, it is uh, a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this event with Sir Gordon Conway. A professor of International Development at the Imperial College in London and author of the recently published One Billion Hungry, Can We Feed the World? Presented, the book was presented uh, to a leadership of FAO, IFAD and uh, WFP, uh, permanent representatives and FAO staff earlier today. Sir, it is an honor to have you as our guest this afternoon and to discuss with this uh, younger audience your solutions to endemic hunger. Before I will introduce you to the audience, um, please allow me just this time to introduce the audience to you. Uh, because, in f well, not in front of you, but behind you actually, is an audience of young professionals from the three Rome-based UN agencies, IFAD, WFP, and FAO, a group of people working in different roles with different academic, uh, technical, and cultural backgrounds from interns to mid-career, staff, but with a common interest in international development. Our organization, uh, UFID, has been established only a few months ago. It is a new network that aims to connect young professionals working in the field of international development. We organize drinks, discussions, and events like this one today, not in any uh, order of importance. <laughs> but um, through our activities, we wish to connect and inspire the people that make up the next generation of leaders in agricultural development and global food security. And yes, behind you is this group that does not only want to ask, can we feed the world, but a group of people who inside or outside of UN agencies will dedicate their future uh, career to work towards that positive answer that we all desire. Yes, we can feed the world. Um, for that reason, uh, your presence here is so timely and relevant. Uh, Mr. Conway, together with uh, Ms. Katie Wilson, who is also uh, present here today, has uh, recently published this book. Um, and this bold and ambitious publication follows on an e earlier work, I think it is from, 90, I heard, 1997, The Doubly Green Re Revolution, Food for All in the 21st Century. As we can uh, read in this new book, Mr. Conway com considers himself an optimist. So he answers the question of whether the hunger problem can be solved affirmative. However, it is a qualified yes. According to Mr. Conway, the future of our food supply is facing two big challenges. Changing consumption patterns, mainly growing meat consumption and climate change. And whether we will be able to tackle the hunger problem is dependent on a large number of conditions. It depends on whether political leaders will act fast and through concerted action, whether new technology can be developed and accessed by farmers, 
whether efficient input and output farmer, uh, markets can be developed, whether sufficient investment in agriculture will take place, including an adaptation to climate change, and whether we can achieve, as Mr. Conway calls it, this doubly green revolution, creating an agricultural sector that is highly productive, stable, resilient, and equitable. I was particularly struck by how uh, wonderfully solution-oriented the book is. Other than the title might suggest, the focus of the book is not on asking questions or identifying problems only. Rather, uh, Gordon Conway lays out an agenda, ambitious but doable, of concrete actions to bring global food security closer to reality, and organized around four main themes of political leadership, people, markets, and innovation. In his book, he covers a broad range of issues from pest control to irrigation, from biotechnology to market access, and from bottom-up innovation to trade liberal liberalization. So worth the read for uh, any of us. One of the topics that was mentioned several times uh, during this afternoon session was the important role of smallholder farmers in agricultural development. And your book makes a strong claim for recognition of the role uh, the critical role of smallholder agriculture. And this argument was uh, obviously amplified by, FAO's, by the FAO's Director General and IFAD's President, and both organizations have an increasingly strong focus on small farmers. And personally, I would be very interested to hear your views on uh, the future of smallholder farming and its particular role in the Green Revolution that you envisage. A prominent uh, professor of sustainable development at the University of Amsterdam and former Assistant Director General of uh, FAO, Ms. Louise Fresco, mentioned in a TED talk uh, some time ago that, and I quote, we cannot just think that small-scale farming is the solution to the world food, pro uh, world food problem. It would be very interesting to know how you see the roles of small and large farms in our global food system, in particular with a view to ensuring affordable food for the fast-growing urban population that we have. So just a few words on Mr. Conway himself then to close off my introduction. Uh, because this book is uh, just a recent achievement in what else is a long-standing career in agricultural development, both as a practitioner and as a scholar. He is an agricultural ecologist by training, um, and has his alma mater at uh, University of California, Davis. As a young professional, he worked with the, as a young professional, I have to say, he worked with the Malaysian government in North Borneo, implementing integrated pest management. He became a professor at Imperial College in 1970 and worked as a senior professional for the World Bank, USAID, and the Ford Foundation. More recently, he was president of the Rockefeller Foundation, chief scientist at the UK's Department for International Development, DFID, and president of the Royal Geographical Society. In 2009, he returned to the academic world, and back at Imperial College in London, he heads the Agriculture for Impact Project, an advocacy initiative for productive, sustainable, and resilient agricultural development in Sub-Saharan Africa, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In other words, uh, to all of you, this is your chance to ask the questions you always wanted to ask to one of the most prominent thought leaders on global food security. And before we will hand over to the audience, to your questions and uh, all the issues that you want to raise, let me please first give the floor to Mr. Conway. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Christian, for that introduction, and, and particularly for the summary of the book. I, I, uh, yeah, I, you could, <laughs> let's please, we'll have it on the web and then I can refer to it. That, that, was, very, that was very insightful. Well, as you can see, I'm, I'm slightly out of my depth here because I, I'm no longer a young professional. Um, I was once, as Christian said, that was a hell of a long time ago, and I must have been extremely young at the time. Uh, and in a sense, I, I can remember it. Um, I, my first job was in North Borneo when I, I, 
arrived there, I was about 22, I suppose. And I was a government entomologist. I mean, the whole shebang. And uh, at one point, they said there were some elephants who were causing problems. I said, no, I'm an entomologist. And they said, you're not. You're the pest control guy. So I had to do that. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, what happened was that when I got there, the, they said, um, you better go around and look at the cocoa on the other side of Borneo. And so I, I got on a boat and went all the way around and got there. And I went to look at the cocoa that was being grown in the forest. And there were no leaves on the trees. There was literally not a leaf on the whole tree, any tree around. You know. And I sort of looked at all of this. And I thought, God, what's going on? And I asked the, the growers. I said, you know, what's happening? He said, well, there's all these pests. And I said, and I said what are you doing? He said, we're, we're doing a great job, they said. We're spraying. We spray at least twice a week. We spray cocktails of DDT, Dieldrin, Endrin, and Heptachlor. And, you know, it's fantastic. And I, you know, I got... You know, you're, when you're a young professional, you've got sort of some clues, but you're never really quite sure whether you know what you're doing. But you, you do know enough about some things. And, and so I thought, I think they're killing off the natural enemies that are attacking the pests. You have to remember, this was only a few years after Rachel Carson's book. So it, it wasn't unusual to think that pesticides were a good thing. And... I thought, I think we need to stop the spraying. Well, I sort of said, you know, to the growers, I said, I think we need to stop the spraying. And they just said, come on. You know, what the hell do you know? You're 22 years old. You come straight from Britain. You come out of a university. What do you know? I said, well, I think you ought to do it. Fortunately, I had a good boss. Now, this is very important for young professionals. Whatever you do, choose a good boss. Right? <laughs> That's really crucial. A good boss. Not so much a role model, it, that may be important in some respects, but in general you need a good supportive boss who will listen to you, will treat you as though you're not a young professional or that you're sort of, you know, getting on a little bit and will help you. And so he said, yeah, I think you're right. This man had been through the war, had been imprisoned by the Japanese over the whole period and so on and so forth. So he'd been around a lot. So he said, okay, so we'll stop the spraying. And we stopped the spraying. In those days, you could do that. You could say, no more spraying, and they stopped. <laughs> and uh, six months later, the pest disappeared, and for 30 years, they never came back. So that was a good start. And if you can get a good start like that, it helps a lot. <laughs> I'm meant to be talking about the book, but I'm really talking about me, which is unfair. Now, look, the book says there are three big challenges we face. One is repeated pr price spikes, food price spikes. We're just coming out of the third one. Uh, secondly, we've got about a billion people hungry. No, let's not get into how many, is it 870 or is it you know, a million or whatever it is. It's about a billion. The, the FAO figure of 870 million is based on people doing what you're doing, is sitting around listening to me. It's not based on what you need to lead an active life as a farmer. So I reckon a billion's about right as a ballpark. And thirdly, we've got to feed the world by 2050. And FAO says six, we've got to increase the, the food production by 60% and 100% in developing countries. I think we've got to worry about, uh, about uh, climate change and extreme events. And I think that by 2050, we're going to have extreme events like you wouldn't believe, and we're going to need big food stocks. So I would go for greater than 60%, but that's just me. Now, the question is, how, how do you deal with this? And I, as, as, as Christian said, there are four ways that I'm suggesting you deal with this. One is through innovation. Two is through markets. Three is through people. And four is through political leadership. And at the core of this... And this is not explicit in the book, but it's become much more explicit after we published the book. And it mirrors what FAO has done in its book, Save and Grow. We have to pursue sustainable intensification. There's not a lot of new land out there. <laughs> do you want me to go through the whole story again? Because I, I can do that. I, I went out to Borneo and it was... <laughs> Um, sorry. Uh, there's not a lot of new land out there. 
There is some, but not a lot. Basically, we're going to have to increase yields and increase production on the same amount of land. But we're going to have to do it with less water, less pesticide, less fertilizer, less emissions of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And at the same time, we're going to have to build up natural capital, which means building up water reserves, building up the natural enemies of pests and diseases, building up biodiversity, and all the rest of those environmental services out there. And we're going to have to do it in a way that the agriculture is resilient, is resilient to new attacks of pests and diseases, resilient to drought, resilient to all the other impacts of climate change. That's what we have to do. Now, if all you guys out there are thinking about whether there's a job to be done, I'm just telling you there is. It's a mammoth job. It's a very difficult challenge. We know how to do this on a piecemeal basis in one place or another. We know how to find a new variety that's res resilient to pests. We know how perhaps to feed a cow so it produces less methane. We know about all those different things, and there are lots of experiments doing those, but they're individual things in individual places. What we don't know is how you do that in a collective fashion and do it on thousands and thousands, if not millions of hectares. So we don't know the answer yet. We just know, I think, the direction we have to go. So I'm glad you're young, because you've got to do this. I should be long gone by 2050, but I should be watching <laughs> up there. I've got my own cloud, and I put a down payment on it, and I shall sit there and look down and think, well, you know, they've, they've done not a bad job, really. Okay. I'm going to sit down here. Is that right? Would you, would you rather us to... Okay. Right. And, and does the camera work? Yeah. Right? It's very important to all of us. So... Th thank you very much for this, uh, at least to me, inspirational uh, words. Um, with the help of Nancy, who has been taking beautiful notes, uh, picture notes in the back, we're going to lead uh, this segment into the discussion. Um, what I'd like to ask you is just state your name and the organization you work with and uh, try to keep, if it's a question, try to keep it to the point so we'll get our guests the chance to respond as thoroughly as possible. Um, so, any courageous, brave, young professionals that want to break the ice? I see one. And there's a microphone going around. Okay, let's try. Okay, it works. Hi, uh, my name is Constanza and I work at FAO. It's a bit of a wide question, but what do you see the role of the international UN-based organizations in this plan that you've got? So. Do you want to take a few? Yeah, let's take three. Oh, okay. I like three. Well, gentleman in the back. Uh, hello, my name is Ivan. I work at FAO. And you mentioned um, systematic intensification of production. And I was just wondering about your thoughts on SRI or systematic rice intensification and the arguments for and against it. Hi, my name is Afton Halloran, and I'm working for the Edible Insect Program at FAO. Um, there's a lot of trends looking towards tapping into undervalued food sources like insects. And um, there's been developments in mass rearing technology for, um, for insects. And so I was just wondering if you could comment on how, do you, how much you think that could actually contribute to the global protein supply. Sorry, I, I, I missed the beginning of the question. What was... um, um, uh, trends towards looking into untapped food sources. Oh, untapped food untapped, sources. Untapped, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, there you go. Um, I like these questions because I'd really like to ask you the answers to these questions, and I think you would come back and answer them. I mean, I think when we talk about the international UN organizations, of course, we mean the three here in Rome, but we also mean others too. I mean, UNDP has, has a role, uh, a range of other, uh, so as UNEP, a range of other UN organizations have a role. Uh, I think the key role is leadership. Real leadership out there, out front, saying this is what we have to do, this is what needs to be done. Uh, let, let me just make the comparison with WHO. WHO has had extraordinary leadership in, in the health arena. You know, it's out there pushing on things like vaccines and so on and so forth. And I think we need to see that from, from here, from the Rome institutions. That, that strong sense of, of this is what needs to be done, this is the leadership. There's a lot of experience here. I mean, it's not just you guys, but there's some older ones too who've got incredible experience of making change, making things happen. And the, there's two reasons for this. One is that the leadership from the European and other, agents, uh, other developing, developed countries it's not that strong in the areas of food security and, and hunger. DFID is very strong. The European Commission is very strong. It's not, this, so Germany is quite strong, but there's not a lot of leadership. There's strong leadership in the United States, thank goodness, from, from President Obama and, uh, and, and from uh, Rajiv Shah. And we, we're waiting to see what Kerry is going to say. But it's not as though all the European countries and all the donors as a whole, the big donors, are of one mind here and are working together. They're not. And so it's going to be very important for, for the Rome agencies to strengthen that. So I, I, I think that's what's crucial there. You asked about the system of rice intensification, right? Um, I don't know how many other people know about this, but. A system of rice intensification is a system that was developed in Madagascar, which says that instead of having uh, flooded rice in which you plant large numbers of little seedlings and you get a dense planting, you, you plant the seedlings at, uh, um, I mean, about, it's about like that for, for seedlings. And it's been extremely controversial because the uh, people who have been pushing it uh, uh, in the West, uh, particularly a, a, a Professor Uphoff at, uh, at, at Cornell, have been claiming a great deal for it. And many people have been skeptical about it, including myself. I think, I think there's now really quite good evidence that it does work, that that planting of rice in that fashion and using, uh, keeping it moist but not keeping the soil moist but not flooded, will give you uh, high yields, in part because the individual plants grow. I mean, an individual plant has huge roots in that system, and it can tap all kinds of nutrients from much lower down. And so you will get high yields. Um, those of you who want to hear the full story should talk to uh, Dr. Amir Kassam, who works part-time here at FAO and runs the conservation agriculture network, but he, he also knows a great deal about SRI. So I think it has more to it than I thought it did 15 years ago when I first heard about it. Um, untapped food sources. Uh, the, I think there's a lot of food out there in wild plants that we could be spending more effort on. Uh, I think particularly fruit-bearing trees. I was in northern Ghana recently, and uh, you look down on the rice fields in northern Ghana, and you can't see the rice because they're all covered with trees. But actually, there's rice growing there, but they're under trees that produce sheer butter. And um, I don't know if most of you know what sheer butter is, but it's a really high-class cosmetic, and you make a lot of money uh, selling it. You don't make a lot of money out of growing it, but you can grow it. 
So I think there's something there, but I don't personally feel that's going to make more than a small percentage change in, you know, in our food production. I'd like to be convinced that, that, was, that I'm wrong, but I don't see it. I mean, if anybody's got an idea about a crop, a potential crop from a wild source that we haven't really explored further. About insects. I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the troubles about not being, not being a young professional is you get deaf. <laughs> Um, no, sorry, I, 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 I wasn't loud enough, but um, there's trends now looking towards untapped food sources and insects has been deemed... Oh, I see. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, missed, I got the untapped and I got the Yeah, sorry. sorry about that. And, okay. and so there's been developments working towards mass rearing technologies, but I mean, the realization of this is not on... It, it's, it's very limited right now. So I'm just wondering if you could make some kind of comment, because I know you have an entomology background, of how you see insects playing a role in, in protein, um, which it already does in many parts of the world, yeah. but on a, on a much more larger scale. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know about the larger scale. I, I know, sorry, I now know what you're, talk, what you're talking about. Um, uh, one of the things I did in Borneo when I first started was control locusts. And uh, we were spraying them, of course. And... Uh, uh, I always used to send the, the driver and somebody else ahead of us spraying so we could capture a lot of locusts for lunch. And so we got the locusts, for, which we ate every day. Um, and, and, you know, the point about locusts, like everything else, I once went to China and I was the head of a delegation in this little village and they put down in front of me at lunch a big bowl of scorpions all with the tail stuck on. And the whole of the rest of my team said, no, we're vegetarians, they said. You know. <laughs> So I had to eat the scorpions on my own. And, and the point about most insects is if you put them in a wok with some oil and f fry them up, they taste like anything else that's been in a wok and you fry them up. So they're, they're okay. I, I, uh, you know, I, I just don't see, it, I don't see it on a big scale. It seems to me that it's going to be much more a delicacy type thing. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I know lots of children eat grubs and caterpillars and stuff. I don't... You know, and, and that happens. Um, I'm sure there's a whole literature about it. You know, you're nodding. You, you go on Google and you say, insects to eat, right? Well, we have an insect program here. Oh, God, I should have known. I've walked right into it, haven't I? Well, I'm really pleased you've got an edible insect program here, right? Um, I'm sure that that's a good thing. I don't think it'll change. I, I don't think it'll change the world. Should we give it, a, give it another round? Yeah. Okay. I saw you had your hand up just before. Go for it. Wait. Uh, no. Sorry. Sorry. And then, then you. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Um, okay. My question probably will be longer than the answer itself, so I'll start off now. Um, this is, uh, uh, I mean, I come from a part of the world which is um, in a transformational stage, South Asia, uh, particularly from India. Now, you would see that China, India, all these economies, they're in a stage of transformation. And there were, for example, once upon a time, India was the sick man of Asia. And even today, you have, I don't know, I mean, um, I mean, I think hundreds of millions of people who go to bed hungry every day. And... The case is the same as the case with Bangladesh, Pakistan. So all these countries, they're in a transformation stage. They're growing, going up the ladder of, you know, economic ladder. But in this process of transformation, I fear that somewhere down the line, though for all the claims of poverty, you know, taking people out of poverty, there'll always be that bottom 10%, 20% will be left. And in your book, interestingly, it said that for every 1% growth in that agriculture contributes to the GDP, the expenditure of the poor, bottom 10%, increased by 6%. And the reverse phenomena here is true in South Asia because you have the share of agriculture going down. So how do you see the future of these bottom 10, 20%? You know, no matter how much you do for them, it's probably we will always have them left out of the loop. So what would you suggest in this case? I don't know if you have dealt with it, 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 it in detail, but 
Um, I would like to know what would you think about that? Thank you. Collect two more. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Astahan Arslan, uh, agricultural economist at FAO. Um, my question is like comparing the original green revolution to the new green revolution that we need. Uh, so I've studied a lot about the green revolution's impact on lifting millions of people out of poverty, mainly in Asia, and why and how it failed in Africa. And then now we're doing the same things again. We're studying the same things in different contexts, different countries. And the constraints end up being always almost the same to me. You know, it's just the same old music to my ears. It's just like, okay, institutions, and now you have land tenure, you have credit and insurance, all these things. And I'm wondering how, what do you think, why it worked in the original Green Revolution, and what are we doing wrong now? So th these things that we already have, you know, drought resistant or short maturity, all these crops that we have already on our table, why can't we get them to work? It's just... I'm always wondering it every day. Okay, one more. The questions are getting more challenging. Very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lauren Lepage. I work for Purchase for Progress at WFP. Smallholder agriculture is, of course, very important, but I think an issue that is often overlooked is actually sustainable market access. Mm -hmm. While we look to the UN for leadership, what is the place of the private sector in stepping up into that leadership role to ensure that they are taking advantage or at least procuring from smallholder farmers? Good. Uh, by the way, this afternoon there were hardly any questions, um, which is sort of interesting. Uh, I think people were somewhat inhibited by having all the bosses there. Uh, I mean, I think there are serious problems about uh, development in India in particular because, you, as you say, you've got large numbers of, of hungry, malnourished people. I mean, far more in India than are in the whole of Africa. Uh, but often concentrated in certain states. I mean, you know, we're talking about Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and uh, Arissa and so on. And I think that's important too. It, it, it's a reflection of the kind of political leadership. You, you, you know, you've got a, a, quite a considerable reduction in, in poverty and hunger in, in, in say, Karnataka or in, 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 in the South more generally. Um, and as you know, the, the British government has uh, decided not to provide any more aid to India. And, uh, there's been a big controversy about that. You know, the argument is, well, if India can send people to space, it can feed poor people. Uh, but often in, 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 in some of those communities, it's an outside influence that makes a difference. And some aid, of course, is really crucial. I mean, polio vaccine, for example, has made... It's extraordinary what's happened in India, that we've actually got rid of polio in India. I didn't think it would happen so fast, and that's because of the vaccine. I think one has to look at other countries. There are countries that have been successful. I mean, I've just come back from Thailand. I got back on, on the weekend. And, and there's virtually no poverty in Thailand. I mean, there really is. There's some, but it's very small. Um, unemployment is 0.1% or something in Thailand. And so they've been successful in creating a society in which uh, poor people get benefits. I think it's good to look at, at Brazil too. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to say that there are no poor or hungry people in Brazil. There are. But they've made enormous changes there through various targeted in interventions. And I think that's the, cl the key here, that you can't just assume that if you get good economic development, then poor people get better off. You've got to target, particularly you have to target if you want to reduce child malnutrition. And I think that's what needs to happen, is that targeting in India to really make a difference. Uh, and then I think you'll get the, the poverty down and then I think you'll get the child malnutrition down. On the basis of the Green Revolution, I mean, this probably sounds like blasphemy, but the Green Revolution was easy. The Green Revolution simply consisted of getting some short strawed varieties of, of uh, wheat and rice in particular 
making sure they were grown mostly in large farms with level fields where you could control the water to 10 centimeters it was. And you got much higher yields, much higher production. It was quite dramatic and they produced an increase in food that matched all the population increase. The great benefit of it was that India was no longer dependent upon handouts from the United States. And, and I, I used to work with the, the leaders in India who, when I lived there, who, 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 who said to me, you know, the reason we wanted the Green Revolution was to not be dependent on the United States for feed, food all the time. Now, there were downsides to all of this. One of them, of course, was spraying with pesticides. They sprayed with pesticides like, like pesticides were sort of an unalloyed good. And all kinds of bad consequences occurred. But basically, it was very simple. What we're talking about now is really very much more complicated. Partly because it's, a lot of the problems are in Africa and in parts of India that are like parts of Africa. In other words, they're not nice flat fields with lots of controlled irrigation. They're much more diverse, they're much more heterogeneous, the soils are much worse. You've got to deal with all of those issues too. So, I think what I'm saying here is that the, the challenge is in, infinitely greater than it was at the time of the Green Revolution. Now, why am I optimistic about it? Well, that's because I've got genes that give me optimism. And there's a new generation that's coming along, you know, that, that maybe can solve some of these problems. So I don't, I, I, I've got a chapter in the book about the Green Revolution, and it's worth reading, but the chapter doesn't really provide a clue to the future. I don't think. I think it's just an interesting piece of history. The future is completely different. The private sector, well, the private sector is crucial because, first of all, farmers are in the private sector. You have to keep remembering that, right? Farmers are members of the private sector, except sort of in Cuba, I guess, and, <laughs> uh, and maybe in parts of China, but even in parts of China now, they're part of the private sector. All farmers are part of the private sector, right? And all farmers ought to be in business, right? You, you know, you know there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real danger here that we tend to see small farmers as being like hobbits, you know. They're lovely little people and they live in little farms and they have chickens and ducks and they, and they, they sing and dance and, and in Britain they go around a maypole and all the rest of it, right? And, and that isn't what small farmers are. The small farmers are struggling like mad to f get enough food to feed themselves and to feed their children. And what you have to do is to get a situation in which, if, at least if they've got a hectare, they can grow enough of food on half the hectare to feed their family, and then the other half, they can grow something to sell, and then they can get some money, and then when they've got some money, they can send the kids to school, and they can buy medicines when they need them. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Now, of course, when you go below an acre or so, it, it gets really very difficult, and that's another question to talk about. So the role of the private sector is, is to provide them with, on the one hand, inputs, so they can buy seed and fertilize in small quantities, and that's what these agro-dealers are that you find now all over Africa. Little mom and pop stores, as Americans call them, right? But you can buy seed and fertilize in small amounts with small amounts of money. And then they have to have output markets where they can take whatever they produce. Let's say it's bananas or something. They've got a nice crop of bananas and they want to sell. They've got to be able to go to a market and get a good price. And, and they need a choice of places to go to. So they can, maybe on the mobile phone, they can find out they can get more for bananas down there and they can here and so on and so forth. They need to get a good price. It needs to be accessible. And these inputs and outputs need to be nearby. 
They aren't going to travel 100 kilometers to go and sell their grain. They aren't going to travel 100 kilometers to go and buy some seed of fertilizer. So that's where the government comes in to provide the roads and to get it to happen. But it's the markets, it's markets that make a difference. Farmers need access to markets so they can make some money and then they'll get and then their young kids will go to school and become young professionals, right? I bet some of you have come from quite poor backgrounds. And you know what it's like to have to raise, to get enough money to get to school, maybe to get to university, maybe to go somewhere else. And there's no reason why all those poor farmers in the world can't do the same thing. Full of time, but we have plenty of time to go. I'm looking at Nancy, whether you want to share some of those uh, graphical illustrations with us. Okay. And then we'll do one more round for Sir Gordon Conway. Oh, um, I, I guess I should. Can you hold the microphone or can you hold the paper and I'll hold the microphone? This is. This is a collaborative field. We can't do it by ourselves. So as another uh, honorary young person, 55, right? Yeah. Hold it up high. I, I was particularly taken by your start with a personal story. And, and then I was taken by the depth and the intellectual rigor of the questions. And so it, it really produced a conundrum for me. It made me wonder. So this, I'm not sure if this question is up to the front or to you guys, or maybe to both. But what questions? should each professional in development be asking themselves about how they are contributing to solutions or how, how are we perpetuating things that aren't solutions? Which to me is a really difficult, thorny question. So it might be interesting to see what you see as we sit on that side of the, of the, of the chasm and then maybe what you guys see in terms of how are you making the positive difference versus supporting some of the things that are actually causing us problems. So I think that personal and intellectual intersection was very fascinating. So I wonder what you say about that. No, I'd, I'd rather they said it first. <laughs> do, no, do, can anybody shout out what you think should be your priorities as young professionals? Or one priority, it doesn't have to be all of them. Just, just shout out what you think ought to be and you don't have to talk about yourself, because that's embarrassing maybe, but what do you think as a young professional should be your priority? Make use of experiences. So, sh shout out, what? Make use of experiences. Make, make use of experiences, okay. Walk the talk. Walk the talk, good. Endurance. Endurance? <laughs> okay. Come on, shout some more out. Be creative. Be creative. Sorry? Dare. Dare. Be daring. Oh, be daring. That's great. Yeah, somebody else at the back. Yeah, don't, don't skitter around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some, somebody over here. Somebody here was going to shout out. Be curious. Be curious. Leadership qualities. Leadership. Acquire them yeah. or observe them. To acquire. <laughs> Any more? That's pretty good. I think they're playing it safe. <laughs> do you do? Old. Okay? 
be in a leadership position at a younger age than prior, prior generations. What do, are you watching out for so that you move things forward rather than not? Because we've, you know, okay, I'm going to be a little sacrilegious here. We've built up big bureaucracies. Have we recognized this? We have probably introduced harm in our good intentions. And we have inherited, you know, this green revolution thing I think really gets to a key thing here. We've inherited, or you've inherited, I'm old, um, you've inherited the harder problems. The previous generation had the easier problems. And you probably have a higher level of complexity and a higher level of scrutiny that will be imposed upon you because of the communications of today's world. So. These are foundational and core, but what are the risks you're going to take to really figure out what to do next? What are the hard decisions that you have to make? So that's what I mean. I, I think, God, we are in your hands. He's laid out lots of solutions, but you are the key actors from this part of the world. You are by no means the only actors, and you might not be the key actors, but from this part of the world you are. So what's your edge? What's the risk you have to take? See, I told him I'd be provocative. And then I give up the microphone quickly. <laughs> I want to know what's in here. <laughs> Can I add to that? Challenge assumptions. Right from the beginning. <laughs> I think field experience is essential. Make that decision to go to the field. Um, I don't think there's any way around it. Recognize that with any decision there will be trade-offs and be able to defend those. Give your opinion. Give your opinion. I think we need to scrutinize the standard of living that we can take for granted as well. We've spoken a lot about um, technological improvements, ways that agriculture can be intensified sustainably, but what about our own consumer patterns? What about flying to climate change conferences, those kind of things? What about uh, challenging the system? I mean, creating forums like this, which give us an opportunity to have our voice. But even in places like FAO, I don't know what it's like in the other two, but I don't feel there's a mentorship system. There's nothing, there's no one who's like looking over and saying, where do you want to go with your career? Particularly for contractors, it sucks. Very good. Nancy, let me uh, bring our guests Back to that, when you were 22 and you were looking at those leafless trees in Borneo, was it? What, what, what is in what? What was in there? Do you care to share what was in there in that red circle when you were 22? I mean, I think, I think these are all. I, I like these answers, but. I would go back to what somebody said, which was don't skitter about. I think you do need to develop a particular set of expertises. Maybe it's just one or maybe it's two or three, but not much more than that. That you yourself become relatively well educated in a particular activity, whatever it is. 
so that you can use that to do the things you want to do. You can't, it's very difficult to challenge and to go against conventions and all the rest of those things. If you don't know any more than you've read in the, um, I don't know what you read, but I mean, you, you know, more than you've read in the, in, in the newspaper or something else. And I would, I would urge you, you could ignore this, but I would urge you to develop a particular set of knowledge or set of expertise, preferably with some field experience that, that uh, helps that go forward, so that you can speak with some authority about something. And you can, so you can challenge what somebody says by saying, look, look I've seen that, or it, it doesn't work, or whatever. Otherwise, it's very difficult to challenge. about something about all that we stated in, the, in, in that red circle out there. Um, I, I would love to see how many of us, including me in this room, would want to leave the cozy job in, in, in Rome and go out to some field in Burkina Faso and work in the field for 11 months or 12 months uh, without the Rome DSA, of course. The DSA there would be horrible. So I can only imagine. I mean, I, can, I would love to see how many people would like to challenge the opinion of the director of the division at the expense of not the contract not being renewed. So, so these are some things which are very, very, very easy to say sitting in a room, but um, it's, it's, it's not exactly something which is so practical in this bureaucratic setup. I mean, I'm saying this because I've been fired from my job because I challenged a convention. So, so I can say that from experience. I think I'd better, I think I'd better offer you a job, but not at this rate. <laughs> So I'm very mindful of time. It is 6.30, and I warned you before that I will be a timekeeper, and I need to be a strict timekeeper. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, I'd like to invite... I want to thank you all, basically, for, for, for being so interactive. I mean, the half an hour has just flown by. But I want to invite Christian... Uh, I want to invite Christian up to, the, up to the floor to do the closing, and just from my part, uh, to thank you for these inspirational words. Thank you. I, I, I hadn't even prepared my, uh, our, our gift yet, but, uh, well, I, I think anyway, uh, it was a very interesting exchange of uh, questions and, and, and ideas and opinions that we had, and I think it was a great uh, next step in what uh, I hope is going to be a very interesting year for uh, UFID with uh, a lot of events and um, a lot of uh, participation from you all. I would like to uh, thank Mr. Gordon Conway for making time to, uh, uh, to be here. Uh, and we brought you a little uh, gift and uh, well, even a card, a handwritten card. You know, where do you still God, get that so in those times? <laughs> I think it's <laughs> Thank you. And I've got signatures of everybody. Exactly. And I just need your checkbooks. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I've enjoyed this. It's been fun to be with you. And, and I, you know, I, I'm just going to say the other thing and, and say good luck. You're at the center of what is going to be one of the most important set of activities in terms of trying to create a better world for us all. And. Uh, you look like a smart bunch of guys. And I use that in the American Express. That it, it means you guys. Well. You guys. Yeah. And um, I wish you all, all the very best of luck. I think it, it sounds like I'm going to come back to Rome um, now, having done this today. They've asked, the, the leadership has asked me to come back here and, and to interact on a smaller scale with different groups of people. So I may meet some of you then, which would be good. Uh, and I look forward to that. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I love, love, because of course, purple's the royal colour, right? <laughs> it's the colour of Caesar, you know that?
Ah, it's also a people, isn't it? Also a people. Uh, no, I know the paper bit is not me, but the the, the royal colour of Caesar is something <coughs> I really uh, really like. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for being here. Before uh, I um, uh, say goodbye to you, thanks also to uh, to Patrick and to Nancy for uh, assisting us and facilitating this uh, this hour with uh, Sir Gordon. Um, do check our website and our Facebook site for uh, upcoming events. And uh, unfortunately, uh, no drinks at uh, no drinks at the door. But um, I would very much uh, like if you could come along with us uh, uh, to the uh, OTR just over the road uh, for a drink and continue our discussions there. Um, and I think that's it. And see you at one of our future events. Thanks. Thank you.